All right. Maybe we just start now. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Perrin Toledano, the Director of Research and Policy at the Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment. For short, we are called CCSI. We sit at Columbia University in New York, and we focus on the laws and policies that shape investment to contribute to sustainable development in general and to the energy transition in particular. I'm also introduce you to my colleague, Maria Diaz. She's a research associate with CCSI, and together we will moderate the event. So we want to welcome everyone to our webinar on Europe's decarb decarbonization transition plan. As you know, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and its consequences on the EU's gas supply have triggered a significant shift in the European energy policy landscape. The Repower EU plan launched in 2022 stands at the forefront of this transformation, focusing on reducing the reliance on natural gas accelerating the clean energy transition and improving the EU's ability to respond to supply disruptions. Our conversation will center on energy and electricity market reforms and their alignment with the EU Green Deal objectives. We will also discuss the reform of the permitting process for renewables that the EU is spearheading. We are very fortunate today to have an exceptional panel uh, with us. Each of them brings knowledge and experience in different areas. We've we have Aida Garcia. She's a policy advisor for renewables at Euro Euroelectric, which represents the electricity industry at the European level. We have Oscar Arnadillo, senior manager director at NERA Economic Consulting. We have Alberto Toril, Manager Europe at Breakthrough Energy, a group of organizations funded by Bill Gates to accelerate innovation in climate technologies. We have Vera Kisler, Policy Officer at the European Commission. And we have Amy Baha, Senior Analyst Renewable Energy at the International Energy Agency. Each of the panelists will briefly provide their insight and we will have time for Q&A at the end. So please free to add your questions in the Q&A section uh, throughout the session and specify if you'd like which speaker you're addressing the question to. We will take notes and address them to the panelists after the intervention. Without further ado, let's kick things off with Ada, Ada, Ada Garcia. Ada, please, um, you are setting the scene here and I'd like you to provi provide context for our discussion. Could you share with us an overview of the Repower EU plan, including its strategies regarding gas and renewable energy and how these measures impact the electricity market today? Thank you very much, Ada. Thank you. Uh, just checking that you hear me okay. Um... Perfect, thank you. Perfect, and that you see the screen. Uh, firstly, thank you very much also to, to Perrin and to Maria for the kind invitation and for the smooth uh, or organization of this webinar. Very pleased to be here with you. So um, today, the topics that I, I wanted to cover um, already briefly introduced uh, by Perrin. Uh, firstly, um, I wanted to yeah briefly remind everybody what's the main cause uh, and impact um, of the energy price crisis in Europe and how the EU electricity markets reacted to the gas supply shock. Second, um, we'll, I'll give a brief overview of the EU response to the crisis with, particularly, with particular focus to the power market interventions, um, although I understand that Oscar will deep dive into them and also the Repower EU. So a combination of what was the short-term measures to you know, plug the gap and also the longer-term strategy. And finally, uh, I'd also like to, to walk you through what is needed to make uh, Repower EU a successful strategy. And then I'll share with you five policy uh, recommendations um, to, to realize uh, the, the strategy. So first, um, as you... Uh, of course, no, the wholesale prices uh, increased by uh, more than 500% since January 2021. And this was um, mainly fueled by gas. Um, the electricity prices uh, in Europe follow market fundamentals as gas sets the price most of the time. Um, Short-term markets are exposed to the extreme price fluctuations of the 
imported uh, fossil fuels. And one of the lessons that we learned from the crisis is that we actually need to improve the liquidity of the forward market to hedge against spot market fluctuations. Uh, so in view of this crisis, um, how did the EU respond to it? So we have two set of, of measures. One is uh, are, are the temporary measures to, again, to plug the gap to try to provide some, some relief for a uh, short period of time. Uh, and those were immediate uh, responses started in mid-2022, and uh, most of them are still um, now uh, in place, but uh, they are being phased out. Uh, those are uh, basically stated emergency measures, um, relaxing a little bit the rules there, uh, the temporary power market uh, caps, and also the gas storage obligations. Uh, the other set um, of uh, responses or actions that the European Union uh, took forward is basically devising this long-term framework to phase out Russian fossil uh, fuels imports by the end of the decade. It will uh, actually kick, in, most of them will kick in uh, mid-2024. Um, and those are the review of the EU market design, which is still ongoing, and also Repower EU plan, which basically has three pillars, um, accelerating the, the energy transition, diversifying uh, gas suppliers or energy sources, and reducing demand. However, what I, I propose that today will focus on the temporary uh, power market caps and the Repower EU plan, um, because uh, the first one has um, uh, counterproductive effects on the EU's race to uh, for energy sovereignty through an accelerated decarbonization. And the second one, uh, I think it's also useful to go into it because it sets um, the, the European energy vision till the end of the decade. So on the first one, the temporary price caps, um, during the energy crisis, the, uh, the way the European electricity um, is priced uh, was uh, very much challenged. Um, this was just due to a misconception of what the, re the, the, the primary cost uh, for the um, prices was. As some people uh, pointed out at the uh, um, electricity market design as the main route uh, of the high power prices, but as I pointed earlier, uh, pointed out earlier, um, it's rather the sh supply shock uh, that we saw um, on the gas market. However, this misconception brought about a, a lot of interventions um, into the power market. Uh, we can just summarize into uh, the market cap, uh, into the price, um, electricity price market cap at a maximum of 180 euros per megawatt hour. Um, Counterintuitively, this measure uh, resulted into a patchwork uh, of implementation with 27 different approaches, um, increased management cost, uh, investors uh, increased um, uh, also investors uncertainty, uh, decreased hedging, risk hedging in the forward market. We also saw um, fewer uh, renewable power PPAs, uh, power purchasing agreements getting signed. And also the, the investment in, in wind uh, decreased uh, by, by half, uh, as you may see in the orders for wind turbines in 2022 compared to 2021. So it's Euroelectric. Um, uh, we think that actually electricity markets based on marginal pricing are part of the solution and that we must uh, safeguard this, uh, this big achievement. Uh, right now, Europe... Um, has the largest electricity grid in the world, connecting more than uh, 400 million customers across uh, 24 uh, European countries. And this is super important because it, it allows, it ensures that there's an efficient dispatch, which is needed to harness the low variable costs of renewables. Uh, it also provides clear price signals, allowing thousands of generators, consumers, and flexibility product providers to trade. And it also promote more interconnection between countries, uh, leading to lower power prices and strengthening security of supply. So um, this was like the 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 the, um, the measure of part of the um, short term uh, package. 
uh, that I wanted to touch upon. Let's now dive into the longer term framework, which is Repower EU. Um, as, as you know, in 2022, uh, the EU would consume around uh, 155 uh, BCM of Russian gas per year. So the plan basically uh, tried to, um, or aimed at um, reducing this dependency by two thirds, uh, two thirds in the first year. Um, by um, a combination of um, joint uh, purchases of gas, of finding new suppliers, of also um, having some obligations to fill the, the gas storage uh, capacity in, in different member states. Um, part, uh, oh, another third uh, of it was um, basically funded on uh, energy efficiency measures um, and also uh, and, uh, a central part of the um, package is about um, deploying renewables uh, in an accelerated manner. Um, so this is again like the ex the essence of a successful transition from away from imported uh, Russian fossil fuels relies on um, tripling uh, wind and solar by 2030 in the EU. Uh, Repower EU actually um, mandated or proposed um, a target, a renewable target of 45% uh, of renewables in our energy mix uh, by 2030, which roughly translates into um, around uh, 750 gigawatts of new wind and solar by 2030. And, and then this is a huge challenge because it, it basically means like 80% um, of the total capacity that we have uh, right now, the total power capacity that we have right now. Uh, and we have to read in, in, in less than uh, seven years. Um, so this target was also uh, supported by an accelerated um, uh, electrification through, for example, aiming at uh, doubling deployment of heat pumps, uh, also accelerating hydrogen production and imports and at uh, scaling up uh, renewable generation for, for hydrogen. Uh, and last but not least, uh, increasing our target on, on energy efficiency to 13%, which previously was uh, 9%. By 2030. So, if we were to uh, successfully uh, implement Repower EU and especially the, the core of the strategy, which is tripling renewable um, uh, capacity, uh, what 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 are the main uh, roadblocks that are you know in in this uh, in this um, um, path towards uh, towards 2030? Uh, within your electric, we consider there are five uh, main challenges. Uh, one is regulatory certainty. Basically, um, those uh, more than 400 interventionist measures um, are harming the integrated internal electricity market and undermining investments into the renewable uh, infrastructure uh, that we need right now. Permitting delays. Um, are also a big challenge, sometimes taking eight years to get a permit when you only need two. Uh, storage, um, the lack of storage capacity is leading to containment of renewable production and also lowering the renewables developers project revenues. Uh, fourth um, challenge would be grid constraints. Um, you know, that our uh, grid infrastructure in Europe is, is aging and actually 70% of this new capacity that I mentioned earlier will be connected to distribution system operators uh, and uh, our infrastructure is not ready yet. And finally, um, the, the issue of raw materials, the, the, the rising cost and the potential unavailability, it's, it's a potential concern for um, accelerating renewable electrification. So uh, what can we do about this? Um, definitely, we absolutely need to stop um, market interventions. As I mentioned earlier, they are uh, very detrimental uh, for the um, integration of the different power markets in Europe and also for the 
for, for the in investment needs that we we have on, on renewables and storage and other flexibility um, sources. We need to improve for our markets and facilitate long-term contracts. Uh, fortunately, this has been identified in the ongoing uh, review of the market uh, of the market design. Uh, on on permitting, um, we need to absolutely expedite the um, implementation of the renewable energy directive uh, by member states. Uh, it was adopted uh, last week, or yeah, uh, formally endorsed by, by the Council. Uh, we are, uh, I think, the the EU framework already uh, sets. Uh, a, a very good, uh, very good provisions for the um, acceleration of permitting at, at EU level, but we absolutely need uh, member states to uh, to keep it up. <laughs> um, on storage, uh, there are also several uh, actions that we could we could do, um, like assessing our flexibility needs more accurately, more uh, on a granular level. It's something that is. Um, not uh, not done to the extent that that we need in in several markets or several by several member states. Uh, we should provide long term revenue visibility and devise uh, probably an EU wide methodology uh, to assess the nature of stored electricity. Finally, on on grid constraints, um, uh, what uh, our um, modeling has identified is that per year Europe would uh, need to invest around between 60 and 110 billions in order to to get all those um, uh, renewables into the into the system and finally on on the issue of uh, raw materials and you certainly see the, the recent developments on offshore wind, uh, there's there's also a need to secure a reliable supply chain and uh, also index the renewable auctions to reflect uh, commodity price increases. Um, I think that's that's a brief overview um, on on what's uh, the short term measures and 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 longer term uh, framework that uh, we have uh, uh, right now in our agenda in Europe. I hope it's um, it's useful and uh, yeah, feel free to, to reach out. Looking forward to the Q&A, thank you. Thank you very much, Aida. This is perfectly setting the scene for us. And uh, now I'll ask Oscar to come in and to share additional insight on these reforms and uh, whether uh, he also agrees that it, it can be qualified as being interventionist and whether it could be argued that a more market-oriented approach could be more advantageous for the expansion of renewable energy sources as Aida um, has um, outlined. So, okay, well, Oscar, yeah. Okay, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to speak here today. And you are right to refer to the EU response to the energy crisis as interventionist. Indeed, the main insight which I have gained from the energy crisis is that the European Commission cannot be trusted to resist calls for intervention when energy prices increase. This is relevant because historically the European Commission followed what could be described as a liberal approach to the design of the electricity market with an energy only design where price spike was simply a signal for consumers and producers to change their behavior. And the Commission's efforts were simply aimed at eliminating or at least minimizing regulatory distortions, homogenizing and increasing technical price limits so that the market price could reflect the value of lost load, and making sure that there was no state aid that would distort the operation of the market. And indeed, uh, after energy prices started to increase in the second half of 2021, the European Commission reacted to calls for intervention simply by publishing a toolbox of measures that member states could adopt to protect vulnerable consumers, and then asking the Agency for the Cooperation of Energy Regulators, ACER, to review the design of the electricity market. But what I think is crucial is that no market interventions were foreseen at that time, and ACER's conclusions was that the market had operated correctly and that they had actually helped to avoid supply interruptions. In fact, Acer warned against applying ill-designed emergency measures or interfering with market prices because that could threaten energy market integration and increase the cost of the transition to a renewable future. 
In spite of this, as gas and electricity prices continue to rise, the Commission did eventually and progressively yield to the pressures of some member states for intervention. And the Commission eventually allowed member states to cap the revenues of inframarginal plant, where cap is the same as you know taxing. Uh, it allowed Spain and Portugal, in particular, to subsidize thermal generators to artificially reduce the electricity market price through a mechanism which was known as the Iberian exception. And the Commission also allowed member states to set solidarity taxes on generators to claw back supposed extraordinary profits. So even if we leave aside for a moment the question of whether these interventions were justified, there can be no doubt that these three measures overlap and did not provide additional protections for consumers. It was just intervention for the sake of intervention. In Spain, for example, the cap on the revenues of inframarginal plant limited the revenues of generators to 67 euros per megawatt hour, 67 euros. The Iberian exception, which was later introduced, then reduced the market price from about 250 euros per megawatt hour down to about 150. But this had no effect on generators because their revenues were already capped at 67. And then the government approved the tax on the extraordinary profits of generators, even though the revenues had been capped at 67 euros per megawatt hour, which can hardly be described as an extraordinary level. So this accumulation of interventions make no sense. So as anticipated as by Acer, each of these interventions created regulatory risk, discouraged investment, and distorted the spot forward and the retail markets. In addition, the subsidy to thermal generators known as the Iberian exception has had a cost for Spanish consumers of 2,000 million euros over a period of six months, 2,000 million euros. And this is because France, Portugal, and Morocco have been able to buy subsidized electricity from the Spanish market, while the cost of the subsidy has been charged to Spanish electricity consumers. So I had expected when each of these proposals came up, I had expected the European Commission to oppose these interventions, and I was surprised that it approved them. And then to make my, my, matters worse, in August of last year, with gas and electricity prices at more than 10 times their historical average, the European Commission president declared that the skyrocketing electricity prices were exposing the limitations of the electricity market design and that the market design was no longer fit for purpose. So the expectation at that time was that the Commission would then propose a major overhaul of the market design with the Spanish government effectively proposing a re-regulation of the market. And, and for someone who works on, uh, uh, on, on the electricity market, those were very scary times. Let me just show you a slide which shows the, as a reference, I mean, there's many different uh, price series I could show, which shows the evolution of the base load contract for 2024 for, the, uh, for, for electricity. And this is the point in time where the European president, you know, declared that the electricity market was no longer fit for purpose. Uh, you know, obviously it was the knee jerk reaction to the sudden increase in electricity prices. Fortunately, as you can see in that graphic, prices then declined very quickly. And the result was that, you know, they declined by you know, initially 50% and then 80%. And as the prices declined, so did the pressure to do something and with the market design and to change the market design. So when the market design, when, when, when the proposal eventually came out, you know, it wasn't so much as a, a major overhaul of the electricity market, but it was just some minor tweaking, preserving the short-term market design and focusing the reforms on promoting new markets for flexibility and pick shaving and promoting long-term contracts for differences between new generators and you know, some public entity you know, slash the government. Still, the proposed reforms, the tweaking, represent an undesirable and unnecessary increase in the level of intervention in the market. First, because additional products for peak shaving and, and flexibility are unnecessary because existing short-term markets work efficiently. Also, flexibility markets and peak shaving products will be used by member states to distort the electricity market price by capping it, to discriminate between consumers and generators by setting different rules as to who can participate in those markets, and to use the payments for flexibility, serv flexibility services to provide state aid by overpaying large electricity consumers for their services. Just to give you a, a reference, in Spain, we have a flexibility service which pays consumers 190,000 euros per megawatt per year, 190,000 
euros. That's more than what it would cost to build new plant. In the meantime, generators are paid zero for being available and for the contribution to security of supply. So each of these markets create more room for governments you know, to discriminate between operators. And second, if the government offers to sign long-term con long contracts for differences with new generators, those new generators will already have sold their electricity and will not offer it to consumers and retailers. And this will reduce the liquidity of the forward market and will prevent the retail market from working because consumers and retailers will not be able to hedge the risks. So for those reasons, you know, I hope that the European Commission will continue to scale back its proposed tweaking of the market design. And if my prediction is correct, if market prices decrease, the pressure to do something will also decline. And then there will be, uh, you know, the, the interventions will sort of fall by the wayside. So at least fortunately, the European Commission has recognized that some of the measures adopted over the last couple of years have negatively affected confidence in the market. And to try and restore investor confidence, the European Commission has proposed a set of criteria for declaring an energy crisis during which interventions will be authorized. More specifically, whenever an, intervention, an energy crisis is declared, member states will be allowed to apply regulated prices for some consumers. Initially, the idea was that it would be apply only to households, but little by little, you know, the notion is creeping up that you know, it might also be applied to you know, some industries and especially large industrial customers. The logic of the European Commission for this sort of energy crisis declaration is that regulatory uncertainty is reduced if the market, participant, market participants know when interventions will take place. The problem is that the criteria proposed by the Commission for declaring an energy crisis are not clearly defined, which means that the decision to declare an energy, an energy crisis will remain subjective and arbitrary and will not actually reduce regulatory risk. Another problem is that the announcement that you know, governments will intervene retail prices in case of price increases will reduce the incentive for retailers and consumers to hedge against high prices. You know, why would consumers spend money to buy hedging if they know that if prices go up, the government will cap their expenses? As a result, the proposed energy crisis declarations will reduce the resiliency of the economy against future increases in energy prices. So, and another problem is that although the announced measures in case of an energy crisis are focused on the retail prices, there's no guarantee that member states will not be allowed to adopt other interventions measures in the generation market, such as the ones they have applied over the, couple, the last couple of years, including price caps, subsidies to thermal generators, and taxes on supposedly extraordinary profits. So obviously, you know, the question is, what should the European Commission do? As I said at the beginning, the energy crisis has revealed that the European Commission is unable to resist calls for intervention when energy prices increase. This means that the energy-only design which the Commission has been pushing up to now cannot work. Energy-only market designs require that the market price must be able to increase to thousands of euros at times of scarcity to reflect the value of lost load. And if member states are allowed to intervene to prevent prices from increasing, then the market cannot work. So the European institutions appear to have recognized this, and they are now considering the possibility of adopting capacity remuneration mechanisms as a permanent feature of the internal electricity market design. And this would reduce the likelihood of energy shortages and price spikes. But it would be foolish for investors to assume that member states who have intervened in the market over the last couple of years will not try to do so again in the future if prices increase again. So the Commission should make it clear that the interventions that have been harm should, should make it clear that the interventions that have been harmful to the long-term interest of consumers, you know, cannot happen again, and it should announce that it will no longer approve interventions that in any way affect market prices of revenues. No interventions. In that way, as I said, consumers who are sensitive to price fluctuations will have incentives to sign long-term fixed price contracts. We don't need the the states to intervene, and this will increase the resiliency of the economy to future price shocks. Obviously, vulnerable consumers need some attention, you know, but they can receive aid in the form of direct payments, not linked to their own electricity contracts or energy consumption. Because when a consumer is energy poor, actually it is poor in all senses, you know, in all areas of, 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 of the daily life. So trying to sort out poverty by acting on electricity prices makes no sense. 
Um, if the European Commission is unable to block interventions that uh, affect electricity market prices of revenues, the Commission should at least establish that any measures must be applied uniformly across the European Union, not a piecemeal approach, letting, gov letting different member states set caps at different levels and setting taxes at different levels and in different levels of intervention. If a price cap is applied, the same cap must be applied at the same level across the European Union. And the European Union, the European Commission, should not fall into the trap of allowing member states to adopt equivalent measures, you know, which inevitably lead to differences in the treatment of market participants in different countries. As Aida explained, the repair EU mandate already provides the tools to reduce dependence on natural gas. There is no need for interventions which interfere with internal energy market and create regulatory risk which harms consumers. And that's all I wanted to say today. Thank you so much, Oscar. Very, very intense um, and very insightful. Alberto, I'm uh, turning over to you. Um, can you a little bit help us drip down, uh, drill down uh, on uh, the the natural uh, the natural gas measures and to what extent um, what the EU is doing is um, using gas as part of the energy transition as a bridge fuel, or is the EU using gas as a way of avoiding the difficult long-term decisions that need to be made to move toward toward the net zero energy mix? Thank you, thank you very much, Corinne. And um, well, good morning, everyone. If you are joining from the US, and good afternoon uh, to the um, participants that are coming from from the European side. Um, uh, it is a pleasure to be participating in the discussion today, uh, both talking about the uh, implementation of 55 measures, uh, repower EU to reduce, as you were saying, Corinne, no, the dependence on fossil fuels, while we as well will be diving into the important topic of, of, of permitting. I will try to make a step back you now and seeing what we are going to in terms of where these transition plans are taking us to, and I will as well try to compare that with what's happening in the US. You know? So uh, 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 making sense of uh, where is the transition path that we are taking you now and, and what's the type of the gas use that we are foreseeing you know, in the next in the next years and, and, and the measures to reduce it. You know? um, but, but for everyone you know, that doesn't know me, you know, my name is Alberto Ril and I work as power sector manager uh, in Breakthrough Energy in Europe. Um, so pretty much following the narrative from, from Aida and, and, and Oscars around the interventions, I mean, we pretty much overall see that this is a moment of change and, and therefore a huge opportunity for Europe you know, to take the leadership uh, role in accelerating the decarbonization through the development of, of course, green technologies, uh, but as well, uh, very importantly, linking the energy policies to the to the, to the the um, industrial policies, you know, increasing increasing its own manufacturing capabilities in the next few years. Um, for the power sector in particular, um, luckily now, there is no doubt that wind and solar power you know, are now the cheapest ways of generating electricity. And I'm pleased to uh, say that fortunately everyone is aware of that, but still we are relying on fossil fuel power plants, you know, that, you know, as Oscar was explaining, and I don't know pretty much affects of the way that the prices are constructed in the marginal markets that we have in the in the, in the electricity sector, you no, know, and they're setting at the prices, you no. Know. Um, now that the Council of the European Union has finally, has finally endorsed last last week, no, the renewable energy directive. Um, um, it's not um, I needed to, to repeat the, the targets again, no, but foreseeing a 42% no, with an option of 45% share of uh, renewables in the final uh, consumption in Euro no, by 2030. Um, we realize and we know pretty much that renewables are not alone, are not enough, and that we need to use other technologies no, to ensure that we have a a reliable but B secure clean electricity supply. No, if we want to achieve these these net zero plans. No, um, I'm more than happy to go into more detail and to the the, the the technologies that we can see that are indispensable in these two areas. No, um, but first of all, I think I would like to to to, to address a deep dive on the regulatory dimension that we are seeing. No, because um, as Oscar was correctly mentioning, no, because <clears throat> to trigger investments and ultimately engage in the private sector, and that it's the most important angle that we need to get here, uh, we need regulatory frameworks uh, to set these right uh, market signals. No? So as said, um, no, the electricity market reform is an indispensable opportunity and on, on the first uh, um, 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 a stand no, uh, to accelerate the widespread deployment of these clean technologies and to achieve the goal set by the um, European Union transition plans, and, and particularly the Repower EU. Um, as we see in it, uh, uh, there, there must pretty much a um, few discussion there now, but we see clear tailwinds in the current proposal, uh, like, for example, the recognition of flexibility as key 
uh, uh, for the years to come and 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 the expected uh, penetration of renewable variable renewables in the power sector no uh one of the one of the issues or one of the points that is commented there no is that this provision that will be need to address by member states no uh still uh, a lot of detail has to be provided there no but on how the calculation and how um, it will be safe up, no, but pretty much, you know, the fact that the flexibility is part of the, the elements, it really starts and steer the conversation you know, towards what would be um, necessary in the uh, in the in the power system of the future. No, um, other elements that are really relevant here, no, and you know, and, and pretty much linking to the long term view, you know, it's how the PPA, you not know, the power purchase agreement, but as well the contract for differences, you know, for a certain type of technologies, we need to work hand in hand. To ensure that we accelerate the renewable project deployment and not hindering it, no, um, when they are not uh, working perfectly in combination, no. Uh, pretty much, you know, with the aim of that is that ensuring a customer protection while we are moving towards a different power mix. Uh, that's the most uh, relevant role. But make no mistake here. Uh, the only way to protect ourselves that we see in the long run from gas price spikes and therefore the impact that they have in the electricity market price is only to accelerate the deployment of clean technology that can. On the, on the first on the first step, uh, shut down gas higher power plants, but on the second hand, reduce their gas use in other sectors like the industry. Uh, and that's and for us, it's a no-brain here. Um, so there are there are two elements that we see uh, very relevant and key, you know, to ensure that net zero electricity system, particularly. So one hand side, as Aida was mentioning in uh, in in her uh, final slide, you know, is the energy storage. Both for for short term and long term, uh, you know, we see that technologies will be needed there if we really, really want to reuse the natural gas use for electricity generation in first phase. But again, as I was saying right now, no. Secondly, to reduce uh, the gas use in heat processes in industry, thanks to new technologies that are coming to the market, like thermal energy storage, and and that are foreseen to reach cost parity with um, um, incumbent technologies in a couple of years from now. But the second thing is, of course, the electricity infrastructure. No, uh, the, I mean, uh, we we all know the veins of the electricity system, right? Uh, the forgotten and yeah, yeah, not the, or the power system, but um, you know, we need to make it fit for purpose for the goals set by the Repower EU. Uh, and that means, uh, of, of course, first of all, uh, that the investment needs to increase. And let me say, but particularly this morning, the IEA and, and the HEMI pretty much related to, to it, no, I published an impressive expression report on, on electricity grid and security um energy transition, no, that highlights exactly this. No, but appreciating uh, some of the some of the data points that they shared there, no, I mean they they, they mentioned that investment in in, in renewable generation asset not has increasingly doubled no, since 2010, uh, while global investment in grid no, has hardly changed no, and remaining changed while they should or they foresee no, that needs to double no, to reach up to 600 billion um, uh, of dollars uh, per year no, uh, by 2030 no, if we want to meet the national climate targets. No? So um, for every for every uh, dollar invested in renewables generation, no, we need to invest a dollar essentially no, in power grids. Uh, both in new builds, but as well in reinforcing the grid that we have nowadays. No, um, so um, yeah, but everything is not perfect. No, and some of the elements that we are seeing missing as part of the market reform um, um, are, are there and very tangible. No, just to mention a few of them. No, uh, we see that still we don't have clear signals to reduce UI carbon caps. And it's essentially relevant what for Oscar was mentioning, you know, when we are designing capacity markets to underpin uh, essentially storage deployments. Um, um, you know, we need to make sure these flexibility provisions that, you know, if I was commenting, you know, at, at somehow enforce or encourage further, you no, know, to member states to be to be down there. Right now it's a directive, an indication for, for them to, to do that. But for example, for example, more more particularly, you no, know, and maybe more tackling the demand side, you no, know, um, 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 and the contact contracting element, you no. Know, uh, when we are talking about PPAs, I think you know, we should think beyond and go beyond and include the definition of twenty four seven PPAs to ensure a full power system decarbonization. If we really want to 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 have that reality and 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 shooting, um, you know, a fossil fuel fire fire power plants in the future, you no, know? um, and and therefore giving the signals for the storage to be to be to be built there. You know? So, um. It is crucial that Europe achieves this, and at the same time, and not forgetting the link to the to the industry, uh, you know that we create the manufacturing capacities for the technologies that will be needed in the in the in the coming year. No, and there is not surprise for everyone that you know batteries, long duration energy technologies here beyond beyond lithium ion electrolyzers, um, electric vehicles, you know, next generation of photovoltaic panels, wind turbines, cable, but as well innovative big technologies like superconductors and set, sens um, sensors. Um, but pretty much when we are talking about industry, green steel, Siemens, heat pumps on the residential sector. So all these technologies will be driving the manufacturing capabilities of the next wave of, you know, industrial reality in Europe. No, um, But at the same time, you know, it would be the, the lever that we will have to, to create sustainable job and to modernize, again, you know, the continent's industrial fabric. Now, the other day I was reading in one of the uh, um, um, LinkedIn um, um, 
leaders, no, that I directly to in LinkedIn, uh, that pretty much, you know, the average age of um industrial uh, manufacturing uh, capabilities in in German was around 147. We need to radically modernize this, and we now we now are on the verge of creating this new ecosystem of clean tech technologies. Um, that you know can can really help on, on on promoting and taking leadership on this transition. No? So um, and that pretty much what the uh, net zero industrial act, no, Com in, in combination with the electricity market design, is trying to do at the European level. So let's see how this un unveils and, and develops, no, as conversations um, you know are taking are taking at the moment. But if we um, look back, no, and compare to what the, you know, the United States is doing, no, I mean we pretty much know about the Inflation Reduction Act, no, that they will dedicate hundreds of billions of dollars through tax credits for clean technologies no, over the next 10 years, uh, but as well that it comes in addition to the uh, bar, uh, bipartisan infra infrastructure lab, no, that as well is uh, dedicating uh, a big amount of money to, to climate uh, to climate issues. No? So a first takeaway that we take from, from, from comparing the US and the EU packages no, is the broader visions are relatively similar. Uh, you know, um, the uh, recently declared US national determined contributions now 50 slash 52 percent, no, uh, compared to 20 um, uh, to 2005, no, uh, really brought it very closely, you know, to the EU uh, to the EU declared 55 uh, percent net target, no. But however, no, what we see in a difference here is that the instruments that they are used to reach those ambitions are quite different, no. While in the US, no, at the federal level, uh, it's prim uh, primarily using financial incentives, um, um uh, the carrots name, no, uh, such as assign financial envelopes for um, technologies and infrastructure through tax credits and loans. Uh, the EU, on the contrary, is prioritizing uh, things like the carbon pricing, you know, biking targets, uh, performance standards, uh, uh, regulation um, um, in, in sectors, you know, uh, but as well direct technology uh, mandates, grants, and financial support uh, um, in a row. So um, that's the first take that we take. The second take is that while the US packages are now low, uh, the EU is still negotiating uh, these, uh, these packages. No? And that really uh, uh, determines the pace of uh, uh, um, um, uh, development no, of, these, of these plans. Um, but as we see it, um, um, there is a clear opportunity to rebuild a clean and modern industrial strategy for Europe that will help again turbocharging this energy transition that we are trying to, to achieve. No? Uh, but just maybe to 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 summarize and to close uh, my intervention here, um, you know, uh, we see uh, pretty much five pillars, no, to achieve it. No, uh, and and one of the missing elements here is the synergies between the corporates and the startups. Uh, you know, to unleash the innovation potential that resides, uh, uh, you know, at the intersection of established companies, but at the same time, agile startups, no, uh, to really develop these uh, these breakthroughs that we need in the power system. Um, um, we need as well to preserve Europe, um, a second one, um, uh, preserving Europe's industrial foundations. No? Uh, uh, we believe that the EU must retain uh, and enhance the, the industry, its industrial roots to facilitate the scaling uh, of these emerging technologies. Um, of course, as I was talking about the private sector, no? uh, we need to leverage private investment, uh, you know, um, uh, forge a robot clean tech industry through smart financing mechanisms, but including public guarantees on that. So therefore, um, helping to, to to share the risk among the different stakeholders. Um, um, we when we talk about regulation, no, we very much always say no regulation with caution. No, uh, we need to avoid an overregulation that could, uh, um, you know, stifle the growth of emerging clean technologies and hamper the growth. Um, uh, when we talk about markets, finally, no, we always talk about you know how integrated markets and you know building at what Oscar and Aida no, was mentioning of what we achieved no with the with the current market that we have no. So we need to embrace larger larger and integrated markets. So uh, to enhance economies of scales, basically and reduce the cost of the energy transition. No, um, um, and that's pretty much you know a combination of you know new breakthroughs, but as well incumbents that in the end uh, you know will go hugging hand in hand uh, through partnerships you not know, to create this new clean tech industry that in the end would be key you know, to 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 take the lead on 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 the energy transition. And uh, I will stop here. I pretty much look forward to the Q and A at the end, but I hope that uh, gave um, um, an overview of the different perspective in both uh, side of the of the Atlantic. Yeah, thank you so much, Alberto. Thank you also for the comparison with the US. And um, now we'll, um, we, we'll shift our focus a little uh, to another key priority of the Repower EU plan, which is the, the permitting uh, challenge and permitting process reform for, the rene for renewable energies. And for this, we're lucky to have Vera, who will give us, um, we, we will, that will set the scene again on this specific question of permitting by sharing a few slides. Thank you, Vera, turning over to you. Yes, thank you. 
thanks for the invitation. Good morning or good afternoon to everyone. So as uh, you rightly pointed out, the acceleration of permit granting procedures is one of the pillars of the re uh, Refower EU package uh, to speed up the transition or the switch to renewable energies. And I will present uh, the different actions that we have taken at the EU level. First, uh, to yeah, give a bit of an overview of what are the main issues um, in permit granting procedures in the EU countries, we see that it often takes uh, several years, a time that we cannot afford to uh, obtain all the necessary permits uh, due to long procedures, often still paper-based procedures. Also, limited citizen and community involvement can uh, lead to uh, legal challenges and to lengthy legal proceedings. Often procedures are uh, yeah, running in parallel with limited internal coordination. The permit granting authorities are not equipped with sufficient human resources and skills. There's a lack of a strategic approach to spatial planning to manage the different uh, public goods, which are sometimes conflicting. And also obtaining grid connection permits uh, is often uh, difficult. So what uh, we have done as part of the Repower EU plan is to uh, issue a recommendation and a guidance to member states on good practices, how to speed up these procedures. At the same time, we propose to revise the Renewable Energy Directive uh, permit granting uh, provisions. Uh, as mentioned, uh, political agreement has been, or even final adoption has now been reached and the Renewable Energy Directive will enter into force next month. So there we will see some structural changes on the planning, on the procedures and related deadlines. And in the meantime, until this is implemented, an emergency regulation has come into force in December to accelerate permitting, especially for those technologies that can be rolled out rather quickly, like small scale solar, heat pumps, or repowering of existing wind parks or other renewable installations. So how are we tackling these different uh, issues that I mentioned? Uh, first uh, and very important recommendation and uh, now uh, requirement is to come up with clear, short and digitalized procedures so that uh, the permit applications can be uh, submitted digitally and also the communication with the authorities can be done digitally. Um, that the clear deadlines uh, are set up up front and uh, access to justice is also ensured. On the side of uh, facilitating citizen and community participation, one way of doing this is uh, to allow energy communities and self-consumers uh, to engage more easily in projects themselves. Another way is to pass on the benefits of commercial projects to the local uh, communities. And this is uh, something we very much encourage member states uh, to do and to exchange their experience on internal coordination of course uh, we already have an obligation on member states to provide a single contact point so that uh, permit applicants only need to deal with one uh, authority who then liaises with others who may have a say in, uh, obtain, uh, in uh, uh, giving permits and um, the human skills and resources. Here we have different uh, also EU funding uh, possibilities. And uh, basically it's mostly up to the member states to ensure that the level of staff is in line with the targets for renewables that they have set themselves in the national energy and climate plans. On the spatial planning side, um, what we encourage and what will become an obligation of the revised directive is to map suitable areas and um, I will show in a minute um, the specific case of renewable acceleration areas. Um, member states should also minimize exclusion zones, for example, by investing in modern radars. The exclusion zones around airports can be reduced and uh, favor multiple use of space. Could be, for example, agri-PD. And on grid uh, connection, uh, on investments are crucial and uh, also adopting grid-friendly solutions repowering, uh, allowing uh, complementary technologies to share a grid connection, for instance. So yeah, I mentioned uh, the spatial planning. Um, under the revised directive, member states will have to first map 
the areas which are needed uh, to reach the target for 2030, and then uh, designate renewables acceleration areas. These areas should be um, outside uh, protected areas like Matura 2000 we have uh, in Europe. And um, there should be a strategic assessment for these areas, which then replaces the project level environmental assessment, basically. Another uh, measure we have taken both in the emergency regulation and in the revised renewable energy directive is to clarify that uh, renewable energy projects are presumed to be in the overriding public interest. This is relevant for the existing EU environmental directives, the habitats, birds uh, directive and the water framework directive. So um, it is a rebuttable presumption, meaning that the contrary can also be true and can be proven but it facilitates in the weighing of different uh, public interests uh, yeah, the high weight that the renewable energy deployment should have. Uh, some member states have already implemented this and we see first results that projects are winning, for example, court cases they would otherwise have lost. So it's um, not a blank check. Um, it does not mean that all projects will get approval, but it uh, raises the weight of uh, renewables in those cases where a weighing of different interests is necessary. And uh, I will stop here. Uh, you will find in the slides the links to the different documents I've mentioned. They are also often translated in different languages. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Vera. Vera, can you just go back to this rebuttal presumption you, that, that you had on your slide and just to explain a bit more? Um, what you mean by that? No, this, yeah, you had just a point, I think, on the overriding public interest, and uh, maybe it's worth. Um... So, rebuttable yeah. presumption means that it is not uh, across the board that any renewable energy project is in the overriding public interest and therefore benefits from uh, this under the environmental uh, directives, but uh, it is a presumption. So. Uh, only if the contrary is shown, is proven, this does not hold anymore. That's the meaning of rebuttable. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, moving on to Amy. Um, Amy, uh, you worked at the International Energy Agency, so 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 we want to learn uh, from uh, your uh, experience and knowledge of the international scene. And um, and I would like to ask you if you'd be able to shed light on where this permitting question stands in other countries and whether other countries are evolving towards this principle of overriding public interest and the clarification that uh, the EU uh, is trying to bring up. Um, thank you very much, Perrin, for the invitation. Uh, thank you all the people who intervened. Uh, I cannot uh, stop myself on commenting on some of the market reform stuff, if you allow me, before going into permitting, because there has been uh, a lot of uh, big uh, and very strong statements that was made by multiple speakers. I think uh, uh, some, some nuance uh, is a bit necessary for the audience in that sense. Um, so um, I would like to take uh, all the audience into uh, pre-COVID, pre-crisis uh, uh, world where electricity markets uh, was working perfectly at the time, according to, uh, to the essentials that we are talking about here, energy markets. Uh, and uh, uh, if those electricity markets were working perfectly, uh, we keep talking about energy transitions. I'm not sure if they were giving actual signals for the energy transition. Uh, even before, uh, we keep talking about market intervention, uh, but all the renewables achievements that we have right now is through market interventions, uh, all the cost declines and so on and so forth. And uh, the market signals, uh, which is based on marginal costs, never given signal to a technology like renewables, which has a cost intensive. So let's take that note, please, very strongly, and which will never give this investment. Nobody will invest in a wind or solar PV plant with uh, fluctuating uh, volatile electricity markets. 
because the electricity markets of today, for very good reasons, was designed to reflect the marginal cost uh, of the plants, well designed at the time for a fossil fuel world, let's remind ourselves, because it was based on the marginal cost. However, the technologies that we are trying to install and decarbonize the system is not based on the marginal cost, at least most of it. So achieving this uh, energy transition that we keep talking about cost effectiveness through liberalized electricity markets, uh, was not going to happen without market intervention, such as uh, bidding tariff, auctions, whatever you can call. There were efficiencies on that side. Europe took the lesson on those, completely agree. But in terms of the market fundamentals, uh, the current structure without a long-term contract uh, stimulated by either government or non-government system, uh, will not give uh, any investments in renewables and solar PV and wind. Okay, that's first thing. The second thing, whether the market signals, again, pre-crisis, pre-COVID, were giving signals to additional investment in flexibility and not only flexibility and long-term storage, which Europe needed, the answer is no, 100%. Neither the ancillary markets nor the capacity markets given any signal to flexibility investments over the last 15 years in European Union since the installations. Okay, there are plants, pumped hydro storage power plants were being waiting to be installed in Spain in the last 10 years, or other parts of Europe were not installed because the market did not give a signal for this such a account of long-term storage. And believe me, Europe needs this long-term storage. We'll need it in the coming future whatever form or technology you want to you want to do. So in that sense, um, I, I think I think the market design idea uh, and energy only markets, when we talk about them as if it's given by God is a little bit we need to be careful, especially in the context of energy transition. because energy transition, I repeat very strongly, is not going to happen just with an energy only market impossible. The pace that is needed to achieve will not, energy markets will not deliver that. I'm talking about on the renewable side. So, and on the flexibility side, the market gives short-term signals efficiently. I agree 100%. However, whether it gives the long-term signals for investment, I, I doubt it, big time. Uh, at least this is the historical data that, that shows us that market intervention was necessary in order to attract clean energy technologies. Let's talk about nuclear. You can, can you attract nuclear, which is well needed in Europe for the replacement of the low carbon electricity with energy only markets? The answer is 100%, no. Do we need it? Yes, 100% needed probably to replace certain nuclear power plants. It has to be part of the game. Uh, when and where it is accepted, obviously, depending on the country. So I think, I think uh, when we talk about the electricity markets, uh, we need to talk about both sides of the picture uh, in, 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 in focusing on what is the efficient way of operating the electric system, which is a virtue for Europe because, because it's huge, it's well interconnected, I 100% agree. But at the same time, how can we attract rapidly the investment that is needed to decarbonize the market? And the third point is retail markets and how this whole wholesale market and how consumers are situated within this whole uh, markets, which are financial flow of electricity, not physical flow of electricity, is constructed and how consumers take benefit of this and how governments approach the situation when there is a crisis and when the government's needs uh, increases to protect vulnerable consumers. I think we all agree that protection of vulnerable consumers for this recent crisis has been necessary. Uh, uh, I think there are a lot of people moved from uh, uh, disagree a little bit with the previous speaker's point that energy poverty did not came to people who are already poor. I think it's a very strong statement. I think many people because of high energy prices changed the status in their uh, in their in Europe, especially consumer moving to the to the poverty line uh, because of high energy prices. So governments need to acknowledge this and 
whether they intervened correctly by, by intervening into the wholesale markets, whether this needs to be done in a different way in terms of giving direct subsidies to consumers, this discussion I'm happy to have, but in terms of the protecting vulnerable consumers, this is needed. Obviously, I 100% agree with Alberto's point on we need to accelerate the clean energy transition. This is needed to get rid of gas and not to pay this high price again. But of course, market intervention or any intervention should not harm the investment opportunity to clean energy for utilities in Europe. And we see the example in multiple countries in Europe that utilities are not willing to invest because of these interventions, but there needs to be a middle way uh, in this picture, in my opinion, uh, at the same time to attract the investment for clean energy technologies while protecting the consumers in whatever way possible. I'd like to remind everybody that during COVID times when the demand was low, the prices were extremely low, utilities were complaining about the loss of revenues. However, they didn't reflect this into the retail prices. However, when the prices go up, suddenly there's an urge to increase the prices for the consumer. So, I mean, if you look at the data during the COVID prices, retail prices did not move, although wholesale prices was halved. Uh, in, in Europe, I'm actually more than half in some countries. But at the same time, during the other crisis, when the wholesale prices increase, there's a huge, um, uh, huge price increases that were proposed and governments regulatory wise pro uh, protected some consumers, some other consumers were not protected. So I think two sides of the story is important and governments are responsible to look at two sides of the story, not only on the market side and find the solution to basically have a balance in between the two. Looking at the future, I think, in my opinion, uh, uh, liberalized markets and wholesale markets are necessary to achieve the transition. Don't get me wrong. They are very important uh, to give the short-term price signals and efficient dispatch. But over the long term, we need to have other markets, new markets that doesn't harm the short term markets, that reflects the, the upcoming new technologies, storage, wind, solar, and innovation in the, the, in the electricity industry, uh, which I think will be extremely important. So in that sense, I believe that uh, the market's design uh, uh, should have a flavor of the uh, long-term contracts. And maybe I will say something very controversial here, but uh, uh, for a research purposes, I think it's important to look at the US regulatory markets. When we talk about efficiency of the markets, uh, obviously after the liberalization of the electricity markets, we are obviously set, show the benefits of the wholesale market to the consumers, how much they saved and so on and so forth. Uh, but we design most of the analysis that we do and benchmarks that we do is designed to look at 1980s, 90s, how the electricity market was inefficient before the liberalization uh, and how bad it was and overinvestment in power generation and so on and so forth. All true, 100%. But regulated markets has also moved forward. Uh, if you look at half of the United States regulatory markets and how they dealt with the crisis, uh, it's quite interesting. I'm not defending a regulatory market, don't get me wrong, but there are important lessons to be learned in modern regulated markets, how they support the technologies, how they protect the consumers, how they do this. So I think uh, important lessons to be learned on that side as well. Uh, we, should, we shouldn't keep our minds in 1980s, 90s where all the inefficiencies happened utilities evolved, these regulated markets evolved, the regulation evolved, I think we need to take a look at those examples to learn, not to switch to those, just to learn how they achieve these things and how they protect the consumers. So, sorry, this was a bit long, but uh, I think, uh, sorry for the urge of, of um, talking a bit of the electricity markets. Uh, one important point going back to permitting, uh, which is, which is, a, which is a, the most burning uh, issue in Europe in multiple ways. Uh, so uh, 
For me, uh, and for the International Energy Agency, I've been analyzing European uh, markets for the last 15 years, probably. Uh, and the, the, this crisis, basically, and the urge to get rid of natural gas, Russian natural gas, let's put it in all natural gas in this case, um, has basically made all the structural problems that renewables have to the surface. Uh, these problems have been around at the IEA. We have been talking about them for a very long time, especially with permitting, and how this affects the project pipelines, how they affect the, the way the renewable businesses uh, can construct the thing, uh, can construct the business case. However, what happened is that you added commodity prices, uh, trade issues, uh, uh, the the uh, the high electricity prices, uh, and on top uh, all the all the crisis related issues within the industry uh, came together, and then all these problems became uh, come to the surface in a way that is not uh, that that was not that was a bit hidden. Let me put it very frankly, um, and I think there are multiple ways to address uh, this problem, and uh, the one that I think is the most important is the deadline structure uh, that the European Union proposed uh, for the deadline for all the institutions to come to a decision for a renewable energy project. And I think if these deadline structures are met and the, and the government institutions basically implement, really implement, I'm talking about really implement because most of the issues on the implementation side, talking about rules is very easy. Uh, giving guidance by the European Union is the easy part. The most important thing is how the regulatory authority of Galicia is going to implement this. How uh, the regulatory authority of a canton in Switzerland, Switzerland is not in the European Union, but whatever uh, federal, uh, sub-federal organization within, the, uh, within Germany will be able to implement this. That's the biggest issue. And for this, it requires more than a guidance, it requires a well-organized, well-oiled machine that basically goes through these permitting processes in a structured way, in a digitalized manner. Um, as you know, uh, an offshore wind project requires right now about 10,000 pages of documents in many countries to be able to get a permit. So uh, people carry these in small trucks to go to the permitting agencies. I mean, there's no way that uh, some people can review this in such a, uh, such a period of time, uh, which is one year or two years. So there needs to be a different structure in place. For me, that's the, that's the most important one. And the most thing is the implementation side and how to follow up with the countries uh, and sub-institutions. Um, and uh, this part is a bit more complicated. In the world, there are examples of centralized systems uh, that are doing this in large uh, economies. Uh, Brazil is one of them, uh, to give an example. Uh, the other one uh, people don't like to talk about, but China is a very important example on this one, how the permitting structures work. Um, and um, obviously there are other discussions in China. However, there's a balance to be, uh, to be made. One important number is that it's impossible for the EU to reach its repower targets without this uh, permitting reform. It's, it's totally impossible uh, because the numbers are there. We have four, six years left uh, before we, we have to deploy all this uh, capacity. And uh, when you look at the pipelines and what is coming into the pipeline, actually the permitting has declined over the last year in Europe despite the reforms. Again, the reason for this is because of the implementation part of the picture, which is very difficult to, to do. So uh, I think that's the main point that uh, I like to make in terms of the, uh, in terms of this. And the last point is the grid, uh, permitting the grid. Uh, that's even uh, much more difficult because of the social acceptance issues uh, and uh, uh, and uh, the size of the infrastructure, which is significantly larger than uh, renewable energy projects, wind and solar. Um, I think it's important to mention 
uh, that uh, grid timelines are much longer than the renewable energy timelines. Um, this is normal, uh, but it shouldn't be 20 years, it shouldn't be 30 years. So that's the, that, is the, that is the part which I think needs to be reduced. Um, and uh, we released a report this morning, which shows that if the grid is not built, the transition is delayed and it's more cost to consumers, more fossil fuels and so on and so forth. I think uh, it's important to also follow up with grid because even if you streamline the entire permitting system uh, of the European Union at the sub-country level, uh, you will not be able to have the grids to connect them if you don't uh, reform the grid structure. Uh, and I will stop it here. Sorry for the first part of the intervention, uh, which was not expected. Yeah, no, no, no. It was great to generate some debate. Oops, Amy, maybe you need to mute because there is some echo. I'm sorry. Thank you so much, Amy, for for giving your your point of view. It's great to have healthy conversations. Um, it sounds like we are um we are approaching the end, so we won't really have time um for questions. But Ada, yes, actually, I wanted to <laughs> reserve the last three minutes for your reaction, and maybe. Oscar and Alberto's reaction, maybe one minute each, uh, or even Vera actually, um, to, to Hamy's intervention, and maybe we can just close with that. But if you can each take one minute, um, that, that'd be great because we're really approaching the end. Thanks. Shall I start? Yeah, yeah, please. Excellent. Uh, no, just obviously to react to Hamy. Uh, thank you very much also for sharing your thoughts. It's super thought provoking, and, and we appreciate that. I think, I mean, we totally agree with you uh, on the fact that the primary objective of market design should be an efficient dispatch uh, of resources. Um, and uh, what I understand is that would, I mean, we, if, if the objective is to attract also clean investment, it's clear that the price caps will not attract uh, those that clean investment, right? So that, that's the, the, the main point of it. Um, on the need for member states to react uh, politically and, and intervene in the market, it's also understandable that there, there was a need to, a need to do it. No, otherwise, politically, you would be there. Um, but uh, now, with hindsight, uh, it's, it's also important to understand that um, there are other ways of supporting those vulnerable consumers uh, without um, in intervening that fiercely into the, the, the market fundamentals and into build that dispatch order, right? Um, like for example, the, the current uh, market design reform that it's focusing a lot on improving the hedging products. It's, it's uh, a well-reflected uh, response. Um, so yeah, that I just wanted to, to react uh, to, to Hamy on that. Thank you. Unfortunately, Amy, you will have to take the conversations offline <laughs> to respond again. Uh, Oscar, do you, do you want to react? Yeah, I, you only have one minute, <laughs> if you don't mind. Okay. No, I, I think the discussion about whether a regulated system or, or a market-based system is better, you know, that, that has been settled a long time ago. Um, the discussion only makes sense if you assume that politicians have perfect information, which they don't. Uh, and as a result, you know, they make mistakes uh, and then the cost of supply in a regulated system is higher than the cost of supply in a market system. So the question is, how do you design the market in a way that uh, leads to the lowest cost for consumers? Obviously, that includes uh, having security of supply. If there are externalities uh, or distortions or limitations that have to be taken into account. But the answer is not to intervene in the market if you don't like the market prices. Uh, the market prices are providing a signal. I mean, if you think there's market price, market abuse, sure. But if, the, if all that the markets are doing are providing a signal about the cost of providing that electricity, that has to be, you know, passed on to consumers, and governments should not intervene to dampen those those signals. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, consumers can sign long-term contracts. They can sign, you know, one, two, five-year contracts in Spain, for example. And you know, and and those who are concerned about market prices can can do that. And regarding energy poverty, I, I, I do think the energy poverty is, is, is a fiction in the sense that if someone has problems paying the electricity bill, they have problems buying food, they have problems paying for the telephone, they have problems paying for the rent, they have problems paying for their mortgage. So solutions which are focused exclusively on electricity supply are bound to fail. 
uh, and, and that the problem of poverty has to be addressed as a problem of poverty, not as a problem of energy poverty. Thank you, Oscar. Alberto? Happy to continue. I will um, try to summarize in five points um, the conversation that I have here and, and the impression that I got. First of all, we pretty much um, align with Hamish's uh, comment. I think it's a combination of regulated market, but as well uh, market-free competition that it really determines you know, how we are going to make all of these different pieces of the puzzle come together in a fair manner. Uh, so that's one thing. Second thing is that we don't have, I mean, don't um, need to be aware to not stay in the, under static views on how this is this is evolving. You know, the, the electricity uh, market and the power market that we will have in 10, 15 years from now will be pretty much different in the sense of like, you know, how, uh, uh, you know, decentralization will play a role, how digitalization will as well, you know, shape the way that, you know, um, technologies come together. Uh, so that pretty much stay with a dynamic view and, you know, try to see what the changes will be coming. Um, just avoid, you know, ending in discussion that will end nowhere. Third point, um, easy solutions and shortcuts never uh, got us anywhere good. You know, uh, we've seen uh, um, back classes you now and, and coming back of coal plants, fire power plants, uh, you know, those, these market disruptions are in the end means to have, you know, um, uh, tap into security to some reliability in the in the short term, but really are hampering the way that, you know, we will be uh, getting in the in the in, in this transition. Um, Four point, clean tech manufacturing is a great opportunity, regardless the type of politics and mindset here. Uh, you know, it's a reality that the markets are going through and it's here to stay. And whether we embrace it or not, that will determine as well the type of jobs and the type of the quality of life we will have in the future. And finally, grids, grids, and grids. We need not only build new grids, that is essentially a, a very major task, but as well reinforce the grid that we have. Uh, there is technologies as well that can help us on that social pushback, that, you know, by shorting out on the permitting, you know, on the construction times that are already commercial available and that we need to make use of them. And for that, we need, first of all, you know, regulation to give the market incentives again to, to do that. So I will just stop with these five points. Thanks, Alanta Alberto. And I think we have Vera at the end, which is perfect because Vera works at the European Commission. <laughs> so, so Vera, please, one minute from you. One minute. Uh, there's obviously a lot to be said about the market <laughs> discussions, but we don't have time for this. So I will limit myself to... Um... Uh, fully concur on the grids. Uh, we have also included uh, grid aspects in the renewable energy directive provisions on permitting, which are not so well known, but I encourage everyone to uh, look at them because uh, I think it will re really help also for the permitting of grids. So thank you so much, everyone. We are four minutes over. It's because the conversation was super interesting. Obviously, uh, every I think the panelists are available offline. I, I hope I can say that for you guys uh, if there are uh, questions that uh, that uh, we haven't uh, answered yet. And obviously, uh, we're all struggling with many questions and finding the answers is not easy. So I want to thank you, everyone and all the panelists uh, very much uh, for all this uh, insightful conversation. And, um, and, and, and I just hope we can continue the conversation offline. Thank you, everyone.